Next, we have Building, building Crypto for Everyone with Linda Noun Lee from Zcash. She's a user experience researcher and a user-focused crypto evangelist with a mission to make encryption technologies widely adopted and easier to use. Hi everyone. I'm a little bit nervous because I feel like they just did a really good job about a big part of what I was going to talk about. But hi, I'm Linda. I think that safe technology should be more accessible for everyone, not that it's inherently exclusive or anything, and easier to use so that the path of least resistance is privacy. And I've dedicated my short working career to that, and I'm here to specifically talk about cryptocurrencies as an example and how we can get that to more people. But I think the general conversation would be useful for other technologies as well. I, like I was being introduced, I'm a user experience researcher for Zcash, which I hope is the cryptocurrency of the future, but that's a small plug. I'm going to start by saying that financial privacy matters, and financial privacy is important. It's not the first thing you think of when you think of privacy, but if you looked at someone's financial statements, you could see how much money they spend, where they spend it, and maybe infer what their values are and what their behaviors are. If you looked at my credit card, you know that I buy something for $2.40 very often at Whole Foods, specifically the Whole Foods in Oak Park, Illinois, between 8 to 9 a.m. Uh, no mics or cameras were required in that surveillance, by the way. It's this delicious lime mint elderflower water. You can judge my Whole Foods habits or what I do in the morning. You can infer that how you will, but I highly recommend it. But what I'm trying to say is that the current financial system is not private by any set of the imagination. And I think that people don't know it, which is bad, but which is also good. No one thinks that a non-private financial system is really bad and they're using credit cards because they think privacy is bad. If that was the case, I think that'd be really hard to convince them. And they just wanted airline points or to not count their change. And I think that that is an easier thing to tackle. And if we make things a little bit easier to use, then maybe everyone will use privacy, I don't know, favoring technology such as cryptocurrency. And financial surveillance can stop a little bit. People can gain a little bit more privacy in their everyday lives, at least for this little example. So not a lot of people are using cryptocurrencies today. And from what I've seen, the people who do are, one, really mad at the system. Me too. Two, they really like cryptocurrencies. And three, they know how to use the current wallets, technology, and clients associated with cryptocurrency. I think to reach the mass market, including this really cute grandma over here, uh, we need to tell her, you know, what the problem is and what the system is doing. I don't think many people know how much, how invasive financial systems are or how much banks have and how much they actually get away with or anything like that. I think they also don't have a good reason to use cryptocurrency. So I think it's important to motivate them to do so. And they also, if they happen to know about it and if they happen to be really jazzed about using it, they don't know how to use it. And that's really sad. And I've seen a lot of my friends get stuck at the third part. So I say the solutions are to first educate them about cryptocurrencies. People know the price of Bitcoin and they have a favorite cryptocurrency, but I assure you a lot less people <laughs> actually know what cryptocurrency is and what it's doing and what it's trying to solve. Secondly, I think we should incentivize them to use cryptocurrencies. I think that if we needed everyone to believe that privacy is a fundamental human right, I want to get there, but I'm saying it's kind of hard. But if it's just the easiest thing to use and they're too lazy to use anything else, I think that's a lot easier and they'll stick with it even if they don't believe in privacy. And thirdly, we need to make clients easier to use and accessible for everyone. A sneaky little mission of my talk is to expand what everyone means and not just the people you know, so stay tuned for that. 
So this slide was the slide where I was gonna talk about user education, but I think they did a really good job. But I wanted to highlight three things that I think that we should talk about. And when talking to other people, I think that you should talk about the problem, the solution, and the technology. And that can be different depending on who you're talking to. The problem could be that, wow, the fees are really high and you're a shopkeeper and you're losing a lot of money. And the solution could be cryptocurrencies in the future when the fees aren't so bad. Or a different problem could be, hey, you're trying to send money to your friends or family in Mexico and Western Union is taking a lot of your money and the solution is cryptocurrencies. Whatever the problem is, whatever the solution is, I think that we should be talking about that more and relating to the people at hand. I also think that not everyone needs to know what a hash function or elliptical curve is, but they should know a little bit about the technology. And as a user researcher, I know that people really aren't technologically savvy everywhere, nor they need to be, but I think it's important to establish trust and the fact that you can even talk about it and make it seem like it's provable and convince people that they need to trust math, not politicians or policy, I think that's really reassuring. And it's also reassuring for them to know, hey, you really hate math, but if you love math, you could actually prove what I'm saying. And you can't do that for a lot of things. I have to confess, I currently don't use cryptocurrencies right now, and I'm telling you about how everyone should be using them. And it's because it's really inconvenient. So say I want to buy some toothpaste at my favorite store, Whole Paycheck, I mean Whole Foods. And they don't accept any cryptocurrency, not even Bitcoin, not Zcash, so that's a little sad. But let's say that they do, or they start doing it, which is really exciting. Uh, it's really, really complicated. If I got some Zcash from working at Zcash, and then I wanted to buy toothpaste for $3.14, and one Zcash was $300 when I got it, and $500 at the time I'm buying my toothpaste, I have to pay capital gains tax on my toothpaste, and I have to choose maybe, hmm, maybe I wanna use the Zcash that I got at $400 instead of $300, because I pay less tax. I'm one of those people, I don't think it's worth it right now. But I'm really politically motivated and I think privacy is awesome, so if there was an app that could even just take care of this headache for me and maybe hide away the Zcash that I'm supposed to pay in capital gains taxes and use my most expensive Zcash first or something like that, I'd totally be game. But that might not be enough incentive for everyone. I think that we have so much cool stuff going on in this space. The fact that you could potentially send transactions for free anywhere in the world instantaneously or make it do really cool smart things like only use it on Thursdays at 3 p.m. when it's sunny. I don't know why you would want that but you could do that. Um, I think that there's just so much more and maybe Joe, a shopkeeper, wants to take care of his family better and Visa's is taking four dollars out of every hundred dollars and the fact that he could, you know, buy his daughter new shoes. That's incentive enough and I think that's good enough for cryptocurrency and I just want to reiterate that not everyone is out to get privacy and not everyone are sheeple that you need to wake up and yell at on social media. I think that if you make it more favorable to people and actually an advantage to use something, they'll naturally use it and you don't really need to convince them of that. I also think that the third thing we need to do is to make our clients really easy to use. This is Venmo, by the way. I think that Cryptocurrency apps should be just as shiny, just as good, just as easy to use as the existing technology out there or better. Because honestly, there are a lot of annoying things about using cryptocurrencies and trying to pay people back. And as a user myself, I've used about eight wallets. And as a user researcher, I'm gonna go on a rant and tell you about three things that annoy me the most and hopefully some smart person in this room is going to solve them. That's my thing. Or not, I guess I'll just talk about things that are problems so that maybe there's more awareness. Who knows? First thing are these. It's an address. And most people find them to be no good. Uh, they're really hard to read. Uh, they're really hard to verify if it's correct until someone can do a checksum in their head. And I really don't know what store or what friend this address is associated with. 
it also makes me feel like I don't know what's going on and like I should be afraid of whatever that thing is. Um, as a researcher, I think that it's important to realize that this kind of thing can easily, I guess this, these type of addresses can easily fish people because it can't tell the difference between that and that, not a lot of the time anyway. And the fact that you can't actually verify that you're sending $200 to Amazon to buy something, you know, that's a real problem. Uh, I don't know of a good way to fix this. I think that sometime in the future, I hope that we can associate addresses with identities in a safe and decentralized manner, but I think that's one problem that stops a lot of users from using this. And it is not just about the fact that it's unverifiable or it's meaningless semantically, but it's socially awkward. If I went out to dinner with my friend Jack over there and I said, hey, can you get me $20 back at Venmo? It's at Linda Lee. He'll be like, all right, I'll give you 20 bucks. And when he sends it to me, I'm like, sweet, he sent it. But if I'm trying to do this through a wallet, I have to say, hey, we have to do this right now. Because if you go away, it's going to be much harder. So I'm going to stop you from getting in your car and going somewhere else because you need to scan my QR code and you also need to check that it scans correctly because sometimes it doesn't scan correctly and you have to manually correct the letters or it's not going to get to me. And when he does send it, you know, it can take up to a couple days if he's spending Bitcoin and I get it and it looks like jurors and I don't remember who's sending me money and then I have to go back up to him and say, hey, did you send me that $20? I know our friendship is more than $20, but I really want you to get me back for that panini because I spent too much on sparkling water. That's not something that people want to do. And I think that that's something important to recognize too. It really impacts the way that people use it. It's not just that it's hard to use and it's hard to read. The second thing I want to point out is that backups are hard and passwords are easy to misplace and easy to get wrong. There are some applications like Hopay that force people to do this when they set it up, which is good, but how many people mess this up? I think a lot, or there are apps that don't force you to do this, and how many people forget to do things like back up their data? A lot, and that currently means a total loss of funds. So imagine you lost everything in your bank account every time you lost your phone or left it at a restaurant or your kid ran it over. That's super bad, and I think we have to realize that we want it, but not everyone else might want it, and there are people, like my mom, who don't want to be in charge of $50,000, but she does want privacy, and she does realize, because I talk to her all the time about it, that maybe if she uses Zcash and uses Z transaction, just her using it increases the anonymity set, even if the wallet has her key for her, and I think that there are a lot of people on the spectrum, and especially because we can convince shopkeepers to use crypto if the fees are lower, or convince people who send money to relatives in other countries to use crypto because the fees are lower. This isn't the reason why they're using cryptocurrency. It's not because they're mad at the bank holding the key to their money. So we need to maybe explore other options. I don't know what that is. Maybe there's a decentralized way of doing it, like, I don't know, send a new recovery password to their email like every month or something, but that's bad because it's in clear text. I have no idea, but someone should solve it. The third thing that I think we need to do to get cryptocurrencies to everyone is to give them what they're used to, like checking accounts and savings accounts. A lot of apps can only have one wallet for one currency, so imagine you could only have one account. Like you can't have a checkings account, you can't have a savings account, you can't have a secondary account or a shared account. You can just have one account. That's really frustrating. We can't also have reoccurring payments. We can't have a contact list or something like automatic billing. And I think that if we are going to get people to try to use this as a currency, we have to adopt those features. I think we will, so I don't think anyone's against it, but we just haven't done it yet, and I'd like to say it out loud. We have a lot more work to do, and I think we should educate the people more, talk to people you know about cryptocurrencies, incentivize their use, and build better applications. And that's where the conversation usually stops. Surprise, there's more. Uh, and I actually thought about stopping my presentation here, but 
I thought that'd be wrong because there are other people who aren't accounted for in this conversation. And I wanna talk about people specifically that don't live here and people that live everywhere else in the world. That's a lot of people. I think that we need to work on internationalizing our apps. This just doesn't mean translating the text so that it's in a different language, but translating the other aspects of design as well. Thinking about colors and icons and layout. Red doesn't mean bad in China, it actually means prosperity. Some of these icons don't make sense in places that don't have some of these things. And maybe you wanna switch your layout to right to left instead of left to right if you are in another language. I think that meeting people where they are in the culture that they are means a lot to them. And there are a lot of people who don't speak English, especially in underdeveloped regions. I think about 80% of the internet or something crazy like that is in English. And that actually is a barrier for a lot of people. Another thing is that I think we should build for their market a large part of the world from China to a lot of countries in Africa, a lot of people have only used a mobile phone as a computing device. They only own a mobile phone and they don't plan on getting a desktop. And I think that's important to realize because a lot of apps have a cool desktop version and then they release their mobile later or there's a lot of functionality missing in mobile apps. But I don't know if you've seen WeChat, people talked about WeChat, it's like if Facebook also did payment processing because they have payment processing capabilities in there and they already have all of your contacts and it's like you have to compete with a big mega corp instead of these other cute apps and you need to have a different strategy for that. You need to maybe integrate into what they're already using. So I think that's also important to keep in mind because if you just attack, not attack, I hate using or things for strategy, sorry. If you approach other people and other demographics, just like people in the US or Europe, it might not work and it might just be because there's something missing. We also have to keep in mind that their infrastructure is quite different. I think that you don't want your app to be the one that's too slow, takes up too much space and doesn't work all the time. And I think that the correct answer, although this is not what's done and I'm guilty of doing this myself, for how many network requests you make, how much you cache versus how much you upload to the cloud, or how fast or how good is efficient enough for a certain verification should depend on the infrastructure because what takes you five seconds on your phone might actually take someone a whole day or two, especially if they have really bad internet that drops in and out. So that's something to keep in mind. I think that Oh man, building for their culture in their market with their tech in mind is key to reaching the worldwide audience. I guess that's what I was trying to say with a lot of words. Sorry for reading that. I think that in addition to talking about the international community, it's important to talk about the disadvantaged community. I have to admit up front, I sound like a really bad person that this isn't the most important stuff to target with limited resources, which is the cruel reality just because Maybe they're not the majority, or maybe they are and I don't see it. Someone wake me up, I'm a sheeple. Um, I think that it's important to realize that there are people that even if you make applications really easy to use, they're really enticing to use, and they wanna use it and they know about it, they still can't use it. And helping guys like this is actually really easy. If you look at your phone or if you look at your computer, they already have features like really, really, really high zoom flash notifications instead of sound notifications for hearing disabled people, or easier emotions like tilting your phone instead of clicking or swiping left and right. But you need to do a little bit of work to make sure that your application is compatible with these accessibility features. And I looked at my phone, I have about 90 apps and only one or two actually have the compatibility or accessibility functions. And I think that if we do it right, it'll matter to people. And when I'm talking about building something for everyone, we should really include everyone. Another person who's disadvantaged is what I like to call low rights people or people in low rights environments. People in Venezuela are getting arrested for just using cryptocurrency and people in Iran are getting arrested just for using anything that's encrypted. And Maybe we should build apps that have more forward secrecy properties instead of help get all my money back because I ran over my phone with the car properties. 
we don't have any apps like that today, and maybe we should build them so that we can reach these people. And lastly, I think that we should talk about the poor because they're also at a disadvantage. I know people in America that have crap phones with five gigs of memory that can only have 10 apps on them. And if you look at you know how much data you can push through on America or what the average phone an American has, that's not the case. But if we make hardware wallets $200 or payment pay processing systems for cryptocurrency really memory intensive to skyrocket the power bill, the poor people are going to miss out on the privacy. So I just want to highlight that. Building for these kind of people, I think, is not the most physically rewarding. So I think this is just about your values and where you stand. So this is not something I talk about everywhere, but I think if I talk to people in this room, they might be all for it, so I tried. Here you go, new content. So I want to conclude my talk with some takeaways. The first takeaway is to build for everyone. I hope that I expanded your definition of everyone a little bit. Not every cypherpunk you know, not even everyone you know or everyone in your country, but for literally everyone in the world, even people who I don't know, have really bad internet or can't see very well. I think that I'd like to remind people that user experience is all of this. It's about building shiny apps, but shiny apps that also fit into people's cultures, meet people where they are, and you know, make people want to use them with their incentives without trying to change who they are. And thirdly, I think there is lots to do. I think we've done a really great job so far because cryptocurrencies are relatively young and not a lot of people are working in it. And there's a lot of work, but I'm not afraid of it. I don't think anyone else is afraid of it either. And I'm really glad to be in the space I am right now. I think that I'm really optimistic about the future. The fact that cryptocurrency and blockchain technology exists and can't ever unexist is a huge win for privacy already. And I want to end by being happy because I feel like when we get together, it's more of a therapy session talking about how bad it is. But I think it's really good. It can't ever go away. Isn't that kind of cool? I'm really glad to work with everyone and make sure that this technology is viable so that people start using it and it actually starts protecting privacy. I hope that I've convinced you that cryptocurrencies are important. I hope that you're interested in working with them or evangelizing them along with everyone in this room. Thank you so much for your time. We have time for questions, so I'd like to take any from the audience at this time. Hi, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one you sort of touched on with your second pain point as far as cryptocurrencies go, um, and that's a matter of liability. So it's one of the sticking points that I see most strongly is people are apprehensive about like starting their own wallet or something because suddenly mm -hmm. they're in charge of everything. If they lose their keys or if they get stolen, then that's all their money gone. Um, whereas classically, banks are sort of, they're insured, they're liable if something goes wrong, if someone you know, steals your identity they're in charge of making sure that you get those funds back. So I don't know uh, if you had any, anything more to add to that. Maybe there's like some middle ground you have been thinking about. Um, and the second question is kind of, I kind of want to play devil's advocate here. Um, but I see, you know, um, I, I, as far as the progressive front goes, um, how do you see, say, if, if cryptocurrencies completely take over the world and replace mm -hmm. all traditional currencies, how do you see that affecting taxation and being able to support um, communities and you know the more socialist ideals in terms of supporting communities. Mm. Great questions. To address your first question about people not wanting to be liable, I think that I don't know if people necessarily love having someone else take care of them or I don't know hold all their money for them, but maybe they like the fact that they're not responsible for it. So maybe some sort of peer-to-peer -peer thing is good, or maybe if we just made account recovery easier, maybe you just ask some security questions and you can get it back, which I think is really bad, but maybe if we do that, people will feel better. 
I don't have a good answer to that, but I think there's a lot of middle ground. It's just that we've never explored it, like a lot of other stuff with this technology. And for your second question about if cryptocurrency took over the world, how would we build roads and things like that? I don't really know. Um, yeah. I'm not the expert on that. I think that I hopefully want crypto to take over the world and still have roads. <laughs> so I'm an advocate of that, though. <laughs> do you want to do one more question? Sure. OK, one more. Is there one more question? Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>